little contest among the staff, uh, guessing how many would be here today. And I found out how many of my staff had such little faith. <laughs> uh, I think some of them guessed 12 or something like that. But uh, I'm glad you're here this morning. It is so good to see you. And the old coronavirus is not going to get the best of Spring Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Not going to happen. So I'm glad you're here. Let's stand together and open our Bibles to the book of Luke. I've preached from this passage before, uh, but you know, the, the truth of the matter is, every time you read the Word of God, it's, we call it the living Word, don't we? Because God always shows you a little different facet of the diamond. And I mentioned earlier through video uh, that we released earlier this week that I was going to be preaching on prayer, and that's what I'm going to preach on. So keep your Bibles open to the book of Luke chapter 11, and we'll study verses 5 through 13. And I want to talk about this morning, prayers that capture the heart of God. I mean, why go through the motion of praying, right? Don't you want to pray prayers that grab the attention of God, that grab His heart? Prayers that make a difference. Sometimes we just kind of go through rote prayers, prayers we prayed a thousand times before. And I want to pray, when I pray, I want to be productive. I want God to hear, you know, what we're, we're saying and that He responds to it because it's a real, genuine prayer and not something we just memorize and spew out, right? In Luke chapter 11, verse 5, then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. Let's pray, stop right there and then we'll continue with this sermon on prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for each and every person gathered in this room. And I thank you for each and every person watching on television right now. And God, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. I pray that you will minister to our need in the name of Jesus. And God, undoubtedly, there's a whole host of people watching and in this room right now that have serious needs in their life, and they've been praying. And I pray, God, that this morning you will open up our hearts and our spiritual eyes that we might see the kind of prayer that grabs your attention. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Jesus had a lot to say about prayer, didn't he? He talked about it often throughout the New Testament. We see time and time again where Jesus talked about prayer. The disciples were curious because they'd learned one way to pray, and they'd had another way to, to pray modeled for them with the Pharisees, if you will. And so they come to Jesus one time, and they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. There's obviously a need there. Obviously, there was something empty or missing in their hearts that they felt like they were not connecting in prayer like they needed to truly be connecting in prayer. So they asked Jesus, teach us how. We desperately want to know how to grab the heart of God when we go to Him in prayer. And we see the Lord answers that in the early part of Luke chapter 11. And that's a prayer that has a famous name. Do you know what it is? The Lord's Prayer. After he teaches that model prayer, then he teaches us more about intercessory prayer. And that's prayer where you get between God and the need, or between God and the person you're praying for. Someone called that the thin place. It means that there's virtually nothing between you and God because you are interceding in behalf usually of someone else. And you're making a plea and you're seeking God, and you're saying, God, I'm not going to let this rest. I will stand here in this spot, this holy spot, between that person and you, and I will intercede for them until you respond to this prayer. Now, that's a passionate prayer, isn't it? When you get to that point of intercessory prayer. Now, the Bible talks about this man who had an unexpected guest show up. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had someone knock on your door, ring your doorbell in the middle of the night, you wonder who in the world that is, and you open it up and there's your rich uncle from Arizona. And for your rich uncle from Arizona, you open the door up and say, come on in. No, we weren't asleep. I know it's 2 a.m., but we were up watching TV. Now, if it's your poor uncle from Atoka, you say, what in the world are you doing here? You know. Well, this man, uh, you know, he's sound asleep. He has an unexpected guest show up, and, and he's awakened by this, and he has nothing to give his guest. He goes to the cupboards. He opens them up. He looks in there, and they are barren. There's nothing in there to feed his friend who obviously was hungry. 
So the Bible says that this host goes next door to his neighbor's house, and he begins to knock on that door. Middle of the night, the neighbor is upset. And the neighbor begins to yell, can you imagine this? What do you want? Leave me alone. The kids have already been put to bed. The alarm system has already been set. Did you know they had those back then? They were called dogs. <laughs> now the dogs are barking. Why in the world are you knocking on my door at this hour of the night? He's obviously upset. But does that deter this host who needs something for his friend who showed up at his house? No. The Bible says he keeps on knocking. He ignores the words of his neighbor and he keeps on knocking. Can we all say together, keeps on knocking? Now that's important that you remember that. We'll talk about it in just a little while. Now here's the first thing we need to do when we're really thinking about prayer. We need to understand that we've got to be specific in our prayer life. We have to pray specifically. What makes more sense to say, God bless the whole world, which you can't really tell if he's done it or not. It's not specific enough. It's too general, right? Or if you were to say, God bless my son who's taking a test. Bless my daughter who's had a falling out with her friend. Heal that relationship. Then when you're that specific, you can see the hand of God moving upon people and responding to your prayers. So be specific when you pray. Look again at verse 5. Then, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at what hour of the night? Midnight. Midnight. Wanting to borrow how many loaves of bread? Three. Three loaves of bread. Now, I looked at this and I thought, why in the world would this man ask for three loaves of bread? A loaf of bread back then wasn't like what we go and buy in the grocery store today. You know, they're rectangular and they're about that long. We say that's a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread back in those days was much larger than that. One loaf of bread would have surely fed his whole family and his friend who showed up unexpectedly. A half a loaf of bread would have sufficed for a midnight snack. But what does he do? He doesn't ask for one loaf of bread. He doesn't ask for two loaves of bread. He doesn't ask for three loaves of bread. The question is, why did he ask for so many? Now, I've gone through a lot of schooling. Y'all didn't know I was educated, did you? <laughs> no. I've got a bachelor's degree. I've got a master's degree and as seminary, and I've got a doctoral degree from seminary. And I looked at this passage of Scripture, and I studied it, dissected every word, and I thought, why did he ask for three? Why did he ask for three? Then suddenly, I had a light from heaven shine upon me with the answer. You know why he asked for three? That's how many he wanted. <laughs> That's profound, isn't it? He asked for three, and guess what? He got three loaves of bread. What does James remind us of? James says, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to get to heaven one day and God would say to us or look at you and say, I wanted to give you so much more, but you just never asked for it. You know, now my grandkids have no issue whatsoever asking me and Robin for something. <laughs> now, you know, I had told John Mark last year when he was playing ba baseball, I said, you know, if you get a hit, I'll give you so much money. If you get a score run, I'll give you so much money. If you hit a homer, I'll give you 20 bucks. I would gladly do that. Well, his last game, you know, we go there and, and, uh, and John Mark got two hits and he scored a run and. And, you know, we hugged them all by and left. And then I get a text from him. He said, you forgot my baseball money. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. How much do I owe you? And he goes, whatever you want to give. And I looked at it. And about 30 seconds later, he came back, $200. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get in the habit of asking God for what we need not necessarily what we want but what we need this man obviously didn't need three loaves of bread but he wanted three loaves of bread and he asked God I think God will bless you with more than what you need I do now I'm not one of these televangelists that say you know name it claim it believe it receive it doubt it without it blab it and grab it <laughs> I, you know I, I don't believe that 
You know, I could pray right now and say, dear God, dear God, please give me a brand new Mercedes sitting in my parking spot. When I leave here, I want to see that brand new Mercedes out there. I could pray that, but unless one of you gets convicted, <laughs> it probably ain't going to happen. Sometimes we say, well, I prayed in Jesus' name. That means like I took the big arm of God, the big arm of Jesus, and twisted it up behind his back and said, I'm not going to quit until you give me what I want. No, no, no. Was this man asking for something for himself or for his friend? He was asking for something for his, his friend. That's what he was doing right there. You see, we need to realize who God is, don't we? I think if we would just realize who God is, it would make all of the difference in the world concerning how we pray. And I think if we really realized who God is, we would quit asking Him for the mediocre. And I think if we really realized who God is, we would quit walking around like spiritual beggars. Are you hearing me, church? And yet that's exactly what we do. We shouldn't be content with crumbs because God is a lavish God and he wants to give us so much more, but we have to ask him for it. So ask God for all you need. I want you to say with me, I will ask God for all I need. Now that's different than demanding from God. And that's different than presuming upon God. You see, when you ask God for all you need, if you're walking with God, you'll ask in the spirit that God has led you into. And when you ask God in the spirit that he has led you into, you want to ask for things you don't need. Am I right? You'll ask for what you need. And I think that God is honored when we ask him for something in faith. I do. I mean, I, I love it. I truly do. When our grandkids come to us and say, Doc or Ra Ra, would you get us this or that? I really, I like that because they're asking in complete faith. You know, that like I just think if I go and ask Doc and Ra Ra, Doc will say no, but Ra Ra will say yes. <laughs> yeah. So we can't be presumptuous, but here's what we do. We say, God, this is what we need. And it has to be for something either so specific or so large that when it happens, we can only say, get this, God did it. You can't explain it away. And often we can find ourselves asking for things that are so mediocre, we can explain it. Well, that's, this is how, I asked God for it, but this is how it really happened. You know? And we can explain it away. Wouldn't it be great if we just started asking God to do what only God can do? You see, James says we get less because we ask less. One of my favorite football players of all time was Emmett Smith. Anybody know who Emmett Smith is? Played for the Dallas Cowboys. He was an amazing runner. Now let's just suppose for a moment. And by the way, I, you know, I grew up in Fort Worth, so I have to be a Dallas Cowboy fan by law. <laughs> I, I started a war here. I started, okay, there we go. But let's just suppose there's two seconds left on the clock. And the Dallas Cowboys are down by four. And they're on the eight-yard line. And let's just suppose, let's just go crazy with this. Let's just suppose that Coach Carson, raise your hand over there, is the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> and he calls Emmett over and says, Emmett, listen, man, here's the, here's the situation. We got two seconds left. That means we've only got time for one more play. We're down by four points. So here's what I want you to do. Emmett, we're on the eight-yard line. Troy's going to receive that snap, and he's going to turn around, and he's going to put that ball right in your gut. Can I say gut in church? He's going to put it right in there. Make sure you grab hold of that ball. And then I want you to dig in, Emmett, with all your strength and all your power, and I want you to gain us five yards. Would he ask him for five yards when they need eight? Or would they ask for all eight yards? Coach, all eight. Why? Because that is Emmett's ability. He could do it. Why would you ask him for less than what he was capable of doing? Now, if Emmett Smith was capable of getting the ball across the line from eight yards out, how much more capable is our Heavenly Father? Is there anything he can't do? Is there anything that's too big for God? And the answer is what, church? So then I have to 
do something else. I've got to trust in God's provision. I've got to do that. Look at verse 6. A friend of mine has just arrived for a visit. This is his host explaining to his neighbor. A friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. He was trusting completely and totally in his neighbor to help him out. I got nothing. I've looked in the cupboards. I looked in the top ones. I looked in the bottom ones. I even have a secret place in the back of my closet. I keep food stored from my kids. That's where the Snickers bars are. They're gone. I've got nothing to give my friend. He went to him in total dependence with his hand out, so to speak. Now, folks, here's the imagery we need to get in our heads. Who is our provider? It's Jesus, isn't it? It's the good Lord Almighty is our provider. Sometimes we look at institutions being our provider, or our job being our provider, or this or that being our provider, but ultimately, who is it that gives you everything you've got? Is it not God? It's God who is our provider. It's God who comes through for us. So we go to him saying, God, I've checked the cupboards. I've got nothing left. Lord, if you don't come through, I'm in trouble. I'm coming to you in total dependence. That's the only thing I know to do. You know what that means? We, we've got to start getting honest with the Lord. Sometimes we're not very honest with Him. Sometimes we pray to impress others. Have you ever heard those kind of prayers? Our Heavenly Father who peers down upon us from the bowels of heaven itself this morning. We humbly bow our heads before you, knowing that you're great. And they just go on and on with this flowery language. I, I love it when I just hear about somebody car, cry out in the name of God and say, I've got to have you come through, God. I've got no hope if you don't come through. I need you to come through. I think that grabs God's attention. Not the kind of prayer when we're trying to impress somebody else. But the kind of prayer where we cry out to God and say, God, I have to have you come through. I love to hear kids pray. Do you love to hear kids pray? I have found out more about you adults or your children. It gives me great sermon material. You know? I read in that little book called, um, have you ever seen it? Children's Letters to God? Have you ever seen it? Like little prayers to God. And one, uh, one wrote this as a girl. She said, my brother is gross. Please let my dog eat him. Another one I liked, this one was hilarious. I laughed and laughed. You ever had, laughed so hard you had to set a book down to keep laughing? And here's what this little, little boy wrote. My dad cursed during vacation because it rained every day. I'm not going to sign this letter. <laughs> Didn't want God to know who it was, right? So you're, you're specific and you go to him because he is your great provider. Here's something else. Sometimes when you pray, there are going to be people in your life that are not going to understand your prayer. They're not going to understand why you're praying that specific prayer or why you've been praying it so long. They're probably going to look at you and say, why are you asking for that? Or why have you been praying for so long? It's not going to happen. It's obvious it's not going to happen. Should you ever give up on praying for someone else? Never. I want you to look at verse 7. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are in bed. We're all in bed. I cannot help you. Sometimes praying isn't the most comfortable thing in the world to do. And here's this man goes to his neighbor's house, this host, and he's risking it all. He goes to his neighbor and he says, I know you're upset. I, I wouldn't ordinarily do this. I wouldn't not normally be knocking on your door at midnight. So he knows that his neighbor is angry and his neighbor's thinking, doesn't my neighbor over there know what time it is? It's midnight. My kids are asleep. Now the dogs are barking. I'd have to step over all the children to get to him and unlock the door. I don't get this and don't understand this. Now to be fair, to this host neighbor, I ask you again, have you ever been startled out of your deep sleep in the middle of the night? I have. I remember one time when we were living in our first little house, Robin and I had a little two-bedroom house, probably around 1,000 square feet, if that big. I'm not sure it was that big. And, uh, you know, we're proud to have that house. And God had been good to us, and God had blessed us. And, and one time, I'm, I'm out, and all of a sudden, I feel my shoulder shaking. Have you men ever had this happen? Your wife grabs your shoulder and goes... And she shakes me and I'm like, and then she said with such conviction, somebody is in the house. My manliness 
took over. <laughs> I jumped up out of that bed in my t-shirt and tidy whities <laughs> I opened the door up, and I stood out in the hall. I said, who's out there? Didn't hear anybody. Not a word. So I walked down the hall, and I looked in our whole house. It took like 10 seconds. <laughs> I looked in the little living room, and I looked in the kitchen, and I looked in the dining room, and that was about it. Nobody. And then I turned around. And standing at the end of the hall was this very tall, good-looking, muscular man. And I looked at him. I, I'm, I'm kidding. I froze straight in my tracks. I was like, holy smokes. And I looked at him. He's kind of dark, you know. I stepped to my right, and he stepped to his left. I stepped to my left, he stepped to his right. I was looking in the hall mirror. I scared myself to death. Robin, that probably took a year, year and a half off of my life, so I hope you're proud of yourself. <laughs> this host did not give up. The Bible says they kept on knocking. The Greek word there translated to English is the word importunity, and that means shameless persistence. He kept knocking, I'm not going to give up, I'm not going to give up. Listen, i got to have something for my friend who's come here unexpectedly. You're the only one who can help me. He couldn't run down to 7-Eleven, he couldn't go down to Kroger's, he couldn't go to H-E-B, he couldn't go to Walmart. He was dependent upon his friend. Now prayers that move the heart of God, really move the heart of God, are prayers that are willing to take a risk. They come from the heart. I, I want you to remember this story, maybe you remember when... Peter was captured and locked up and put in jail. Do you remember that story? He's put in jail over in Acts chapter 12, I believe. He's locked up. And so the little church had gathered in Mark's home, or Mary's home rather, the, the mother of Mark. And they're praying and they're saying, God, please release Peter. We need you to save our friend. Just somehow, some way, help out our friend Peter because he's locked up. And there he was between two Roman soldiers. The Christians are gathered there in Mary's home, and they're praying for him. And the Bible says that God sent an angel, and the angel freed Peter. And Peter went right through the gate as if he was a ghost or something. And what does he do? He goes straight to Mary's house, and he knocks on the door. And Rhoda comes up and says, it's Peter. And then she turns around and runs back to the back of the house and tells the people gathered there praying for Peter, guess what? Guess what? Peter is at the front door. And you know what they did? Instead of celebrating, they chastised her for exaggerating. Isn't that just like us? Sometimes even when God comes through, we don't see it. Or we really don't believe it. That means that we're not supposed to pray in doubt. When I read that story, they're back there praying for the release of Peter, but they were praying in faith or in doubt, church? In doubt. Don't pray in doubt. You've got to believe that God will come through when you pray, and don't be surprised when he does. Expect it. Expect it. Not out of arrogance, but out of humility. Just know that God loves you. Here's another thing. I've got to be willing to forfeit all of my pride I've got to lay it aside. In verse 8 it says, but I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. There's that word importunity. I'm sure that this, this host was a little bit embarrassed. I mean, wouldn't you be kind of embarrassed if you had someone show up from out of town? It'd be embarrassing, first of all, for them to discover you've got nothing in your whole house to eat. And let's just suppose your car is broken down and you can't jump in and go anywhere and get your friend something to eat who is desperately hungry. And so you've got to go next door to your neighbor's house at midnight, start knocking on the door. You know what he was willing to do? He was willing to lay his reputation aside because he was more interested in his friend's need than what it was going to cost him, maybe a little embarrassment. Are we too embarrassed to pray? Listen, when you go out to eat, do you think that you should bow your head and pray? Pastor, we're in public. You might offend somebody. Let them be offended. You got all these other yahoos, bless their heart. They're willing to stand up 
and say this is what they stand for and they're hundred percent wrong in what they stand for but they're not ashamed to say what they stand for and we've got Christians who know the truth and know the Lord God and know the living Lord Jesus and we're too embarrassed to pray at a restaurant are you kidding me if you go to a restaurant and you're too embarrassed to pray I hope that your steak comes out the wrong way I hope that what happened to my stepdad many years ago, we went to Luby's or Furs or one of those cafeterias and got one of those twice baked uh, potatoes and he got a, a spoonful of it, put it in his mouth and something, he hit something crunchy and he took it out and it was a tooth. <laughs> and it wasn't his tooth. Now, I mean, you've seen those people that work at Luby's. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, sir. There's some great people. There's some great people. I eat there, so I'm just joking. So if you get a baked potato and you don't pray and ask God to bless it, I'm going to pray there's a tooth in it. We can't be ashamed to pray. Amen. We were somewhere the other day, and, and Daryl asked, uh, our waiter, can we pray for you? And they said, yes, they, you know. I've done that multiple, multiple, multiple times where I've asked waiters, or servers rather, you know, can we pray for you? Is there anything we can pray for you about? And one time we were at the uh, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, and we were in some God-forsaken city outside in West Texas. In fact, that whole half of the state is pretty much God-forsaken. But that's where, that's where uh, Barry Klempenauer is from, you know. So. <laughs> And so we asked, we asked the server, can we pray for you about anything? And, and the server immediately started crying. I mean, just instantly tears started pouring out of her eyes. And she said, yes, please, I need prayer. And she gave us a hint of what she needed prayer for. Not all of it, but a hint. And we prayed for her. I received a note from her when we left. And she said, you will never know. I needed God to speak to me tonight and tell me he hadn't forgotten me and God used you men to remind me God still loves me. Pray. Don't be ashamed to pray. Don't be afraid or ashamed to reach out in the name of Jesus anywhere. I, I phoned to the Holy Land and uh, two or three times during that flight, the Muslims all gathered, started bowing toward the east. They didn't care who was watching, didn't care who was around. And they said their little Muslim prayers. They're not ashamed. Why should we be? Are you with me, church? Amen. Here's the last thing, and all God's people said. Amen. Don't get that excited. Here's the last thing. Keep on knocking until God comes through. Keep on knocking until God comes through. In verse 9. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive. Does it say you might receive or may receive? Oh, it says you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Your fathers, you fathers, if your children ask you for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The host received what he asked for because he kept on knocking. And even though he may have not done it because he was a neighbor or even a good friend, he did it because of the host's persistence. The neighbor came through. Don't grow weary in your prayers. And I know that's easy to do. Some of you women might be saying right now, Pastor, I have prayed for my lost husband for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, or maybe even longer. I prayed for my lost stepdad for over 20 years before he got saved. But God finally saved him. Maybe some of you have been praying for a long time about a marriage that's in shambles. Or maybe it's your finances that are torn up, messed up. Maybe it's a job you just lost or you're afraid you're going to lose it. Or maybe you need a, a better job where you make more money can, and can provide better for your family. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you've just gotten tired. You're just weary. Don't grow weary in your prayers. And then remember to pray selflessly. 
and not selfishly. God will honor your heart when you pray selflessly instead of selfishly. I remember reading a story about a boy who had cancer and he was not going to live. You ever heard of the Make-A-Wish program? I think that's a wonderful program. And the little boy was picked to be in that Make-A-Wish program. You know what he asked for? He wanted to go to Disneyland and be an ice cream vendor at Disneyland so he could give his friends and other people free ice cream all day long. That's why. If he wants something for himself, he just wanted to give free ice cream to his friends. That's where our prayers need to be. Like giving away free ice cream to our friends. Not selfish, but a heart full of gratitude and thankfulness and praying for others as well as yourself. That's what we should do. 